Hey, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure to like this video and then subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss a message in any of our learning series, but especially today, we're closing out this learning series we've been in called All My Friends, and we've been talking about the relationships that we have. I think when we have relationship series in church, we mostly talk about either dating or marriage, and I'm cool with that, and maybe I'll do a marriage series later on sometime, but really in my heart, I really believe that the most intimate relationships we have are with our friends. Outside of our marriage, outside of the dating relationship, we have friendships, and if we don't know how to navigate those friendships, everything can fall apart. We've all had that one person we let into our lives who is a bad influence, they're toxic, whatever term you wanna put on it, but we, because we have so much grace, we think we just gotta keep ministering to that person and surely they will change. That was, that was a lot of laughter, which tells me we've all done that way too many times. And here's the thing, maybe you're not the one to lead them to Jesus. Maybe you were the one to lead them one step closer, but you're not the one to take them all the way. So I'll talk about that in this uh, message today, but as I get older, I'll tell you, my circle of friends has begun to wane. It has gotten smaller. It's become more tight-knit. I'm bonding with specific people more. When I was a teenager, when I was a student, man, I wanted all the friends. I wanted to be popular. I wanted everybody to like me and accept me, but really now I'm realizing as a mature adult, I don't need that many people in my life. I've got a few good friends, and that's really all I need. And so I told you at the beginning of this learning series, I read an article by a psychologist, and she said that we have seven categories of friends at all times. And there are people in our lives who are a part of each of these. And I'll go through these really briefly. You have your lifelong friends, your best friends, your close friends. Those are the three heaviest relationships you have. Then you have your social group friends. that You socialize with them, but you're not really particularly close. You have activity friends, such as gym buddies or a member of your book club or whatever. Then you have your friends of convenience, and those are the people who, uh, you youth sport team parents, that's you. You have the, the dad that you just talked to at the football game, but you really don't care about at all. Uh, and then lastly, you have your acquaintance friends. These are the people that you see at work. These are the people you see when you're out walking your dog. And what's interesting about this list of seven categories of friends is your acquaintance friends are the, the people you spend the most time with, usually, and your best friends, your close friends, your lifelong friends are actually the ones you see the least, which is so interesting to me. The irony there is not lost on me. But she talked about how we have to allow all seven categories of these people into our lives because it can actually help us grow. And I'm going to share about that today. I believe that God wants us to have friendships for his glory. But today, as I close out this series, I want to talk to you about the most important thing you're going to do in your relationship. So today's message is this. All my friends know my boundaries. All my friends know my boundaries. Somebody say boundaries. Some of you need some boundaries. All my friends know my boundaries. Hey, open up your Bibles today. We're going to go to Psalm chapter 16. Psalm chapter 16. I want you to read this with me. Psalm chapter 16. If you see somebody without a Bible, snuggle up close and say, you can share with me today because I want us all to be in the word of God. Somebody asked me one time, why do you always make people get into their Bibles? There's two reasons. Number one, because I believe we need to be in unity when we're together in church. And so when we're all in our Bibles, that's important. Number two, because I could be saying anything and you don't know if I'm actually telling the truth. So get in your own Bible. Don't just trust a dude on stage. Get in your Bible. Check me on this. You need to have your own relationship with your own Bible, not me. Ooh, ooh, Jesus, anyway. A couple of years ago, we had a, uh, an incident. There was um, a few people that was sitting on our property. Uh, if, you, if you look at our property, it doesn't look that big. In fact, this building was owned by another church before us. It was gifted to us. We merged churches, and then they became Revived Church, which was a great blessing. But what we're starting to learn here is that this church property actually is about two acres. What we see is about 0.8 acres, but it actually goes back into Johnson Creek behind here. It goes uh, over uh, around Carter Junior High as well, which is crazy. But we own about 2.2 acres is what we've recently found out. And so our property line is kind of weird. But a couple years ago, we had <clears throat> an incident where there were a few people who 
Um, I don't want to use the term homeless. It's not that they were homeless. They were off the grid. And they were off the grid because they were doing illegal activities. Uh, Just to be completely transparent, it was a guy who had been arrested several times. He carried around a machete for protection, if that tells you anything. Uh, But there was him, another guy, and there was a woman who I honestly would not be able to guess her age because of how many drugs she has done. But it was very obvious they were pimping her out. Uh, It was very obvious there was a lot of illegal activity going on. When we would go back there, they had uh, beer cans piled up as high as possible. So I went back there and had a nice little conversation in the daytime and said, uh, hey, you got to go. This is our property. You are not allowed to do anything here. Number one, you can't live on our property. That's a liability issue, but you need to move on. Okay, no problem, man, no problem. I said, I'll give you just a few days because I know how, how it's like when you got to gather all your belongings and everything. I'll give you a few days. Okay. Well, a few days passes by. He basically tells me we ain't going nowhere. So I called the Arlington Police Department and they sent out a rookie. Now, rookies are great. They got to learn. But we had a rookie cop who came out, and he was very nice. But at the time, I said, hey, these people are on our property. Uh, They are not allowed to be. They're definitely doing illegal activity. Uh, We're asking that you no trespass them, which means the cop tells them you are no longer allowed on this property. I, I said, I've already asked you once. You can't come back. At the same time, though, so you have the full version at the same time, there were some nurses who showed up from a hospital in Dallas, and they were doing a wellness check. They actually knew these people. They were doing a wellness check to make sure that they were up to date on their vaccines and all this other stuff. Uh, so long story short, these nurses that showed up were trying to make it sound like I was some kind of demonic, hellish pastor who would not let people live on our property. And so they're trying to convince the cop to let these people stay. Long story shorter, the cop comes to me and I I said, please go tell them they have to go. He comes back, knocks on the door. He says, hey, I can't tell them to go. They're not on your property. I said, yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, sir, they are. And I'm trying to be respectful, right? He pulls out his phone and opens Google Maps and tries to show me on Google Maps where our property line is. And I says, sir, with all due respect, Google Maps is not a legal document showing our property line. They are on our property. He said, well, they don't have to go because I said they're not on your property. Now, look, I was respectful. He was an idiot. (laughs) But I didn't want to go to jail because the way the media would spin it was local pastor goes to jail for assaulting a police officer after trying to remove homeless people from his property. (laughs) I knew in my heart, the Holy Spirit was like, calm down, bro. Just calm down. So I waited 24 hours. I called Arlington PD again. This time they sent out a 20-year veteran. He came to the door. He said, uh, yes, Pastor Kilgore, I heard that you have a, an issue with some, uh, uh, I forgot what word he used, but some people on your property. Yes, sir. Uh, I said, if we could, you know, no trespass them. We've asked them several times to leave. They haven't left. And so I thought that maybe he had in some kind of communication with the guy the day before. And I thought that other guy had probably told this guy, they're not on the property line or whatever. And I said, sir, um, you know, th- this is our property line. And we had somebody yesterday. He said, oh, I don't need to hear all that. He said, if you tell me it's your property, I know it's your property. I've been here for 20 years. I know where your property line is. I know where the boundaries are. He said, I know they're doing something illegal. He said, because I've arrested that young man many times. <laughs> I know they have to go. And he, no trespass them, and they're not allowed on our property. Now, this is how, there's two categories of people. This is how we run our friendships. Some of us are rookies when it comes to friendships. We don't know where the property line is. We don't know where the boundary is in our friendship. So what do we do? We let other people define it for us. Some third party. Oh, you say that I should let this person into my life? Oh, okay. Some of us are veterans. We've been doing the relationship game for a while, and we know where the property line is, and you don't need to tell me where it is or is not. I have already determined it. I've already researched it. It is already solidified, and you're not coming past this boundary. And if you get on this boundary, I will no trespass you out my life. There's two types of people. And what I want to help you do today is I want to help you mature today so that you can have clear boundaries in your life. When you go read the Bible, the Bible is full of clear boundaries. By God's grace, he gives us boundaries. But today I want to show you the idea of boundaries from the prophet and the king, David. David. In Psalm chapter 16, we're going to read this whole thing. Here's what he says. He says, keep me safe, my God. This is a song slash prayer. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. That's a boundary. 
I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. That's a boundary. I say of the holy people who are in the land. What land? The land that has a boundary. They are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. That's a boundary. And he even says it in verse 6, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. That means if he counsels me, there's a boundary. Nobody else does. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. That's a boundary. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Psalm 16 is something we should know because it is all about boundaries. He lists out over and over and over, my God is this. I will sit here. I will stand here. I will do this and I will not do that. I will have boundaries. In verse 6, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And this phrase makes it sound like sometimes boundaries are just appearing. But in reality, boundaries are built. Somebody say that out loud. Say, boundaries are built. Boundaries are built. You have to build boundaries in your own life. You have to build boundaries in your friendships. So today I want to share with you three boundaries that if I could go back 30 years and tell my very, very young self, these are the three boundaries you need to build in your friendships, I would do this immediately. So here's what I want to encourage you. This message applies to everyone, but if you are of the age of 30 or under, please take notes, write it over and over, like you would write a girl's name over and over on your notebook. You know, did we do that? I don't know if they do that anymore, but you know, <laughs> Mr. and Mrs., da, 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 whatever. Write it over and over. These are three boundaries you need to have in your relationships and in your friendships. The first one is this. I wish I had, could tell my younger self, put boundaries around your faith. Put boundaries around your faith. You have to have boundaries around your faith. This really became a big deal to me when I went to college. Uh, a little background on me, because I know we got a lot of first-time guests today, and maybe a returning guest. You don't know me that well. Uh, I will tell you, I grew up in a Christian-ish home. Uh, we went to church every Sunday. My parents were Christians. They both are going to heaven. My mom's in heaven now. My dad will go to heaven when he dies. I believe that. Uh, however, it wasn't always a Christian environment. That's the best way to say it. Uh, that We had our own conflicts. We had our own issues as a family. But we were in church all the time. I grew up in church. Uh, not only that, but the, ch the church ran a private Christian school, and I was at that school every day. Not only that, but I volunteered in the church, and I played piano with the band. And so I'm just trying to get you to understand, 24-7, church was my life. Church was my life. Let me say it one more time. Church was my life, but my life wasn't rooted in faith. You can come to church all you want, but until you have boundaries around your faith, you really don't have that healthy relationship with God that you need. So I heard the word all the time. I was a Christian, so forth, so on. I could speak in tongues when I was 10 years old. I rondai shandai with the best of them. I could tithe and when I was a kid. I, I've tithed my entire life. So all these things that you know you're supposed to do as a Christian, you'd hear pastors talk about, I was doing it. But then I got to college, and I went to Texas Christian University. Listen, just because it's got Christian in the name, don't mean it's Christian values. And I went there, got accepted, was really excited, and really quickly learned this is not a Christian school. But one of the things that really stood out to me, and, and the, I think the, the watershed moment for me to really solidify my faith was when someone that I also grew up with, someone who also went to the same church, the same school, had the same environment, the same Christian parents, not, not same Christian parents, but you know they had Christian parents, they went to the same school. And our... Our, our relationship with the school became skewed, of course. I was going down the business track, and they were going down the, the theological track. But when they got introduced to the theological program at Texas Christian University, the whole theological track was built to cause you to doubt your faith. 
The whole thing was to introduce you to world religions and critical thinking. And How do you know Jesus really was resurrected? Was he even real? How do you know that Islam is not correct? How do you know that Zaoism is not correct? And so he goes down this track, and the head of the religion department takes him under her wing, and she begins to fill his head with all these ideas. And I remember being out with him one time, and he looks at me, and he says, Stephen, I don't know if anything we've ever learned is right. And I was like, bro, what? That, that shook me to my core because this guy of all people, I thought, he's the one. He's the chosen one. There's no way he is doubting his faith right now. And I had to make a choice in that moment. Do I want to go down that trail with him? Do I want to question my... Because he started showing me some manuscripts and some historical artifacts and all these other things and said, well, I, you know, I'm not sure. My professor's telling me this may not be real. And she's a Christian, but she's telling me I need to, I need to question my own faith. And that was a defining moment for me. Now, God bless our students. If you're not praying for the students of this church, please start immediately. Because I went to college back in the day when we didn't have social media. Facebook was just becoming a thing. Y'all remember when Facebook, you had to have a university email address to get on? Then they introduced your parents to it. You're like, well, it's going to hell now. <laughs> Today, I can get on TikTok, I can get on Instagram, and I can watch video after video after video after video after video convincing me Jesus was not the Messiah. Jesus did not die on a cross. Jesus was not resurrected. He was not a prophet. He wasn't even a real character in history. Quickly, just like that, I can get that information. And if I don't know the truth, if I don't have faith in the truth of what the Bible says, I will be easily swayed around. I made a decision. I will have boundaries around my faith. Here's what that means for me. It means I will believe what the Bible says regardless of what anybody else says. Now, the older generations, that was what they came to. It was just the Bible says this. Boom. Boom. I don't care about what nothing else says. But here's what you also have to learn. A boundary of your faith does not mean you reject other people's knowledge and wisdom. It means you might need some supplemental information based on your faith. So I did my own research, and I don't have a lot of time. I'm not going to go into this deep today. There are scholarly documents, scholarly manuscripts there are archaeological, there's archaeological, excuse me, evidence. Jesus was real. He did exist. He yeah. did die for our sins. He was resurrected. He did reappear. There is word of mouth and there is documented history of this. So here's the question. If there's two disagreeing viewpoints, how do I know which to choose? Depends. Do you have a boundary around your faith? When I'm in relationship with people, so then I, I go to college and I start working at different jobs, you know. And oh, by the way, I worked at the church too for a long time too. Like I, my whole life was church for a long time. Then I started working out in the world and I realized not everybody's a Christian. Shocking, not everybody's a Christian. And as we're talking and as we're having conversations, I would begin to share my faith and they would begin to tell me I was wrong. And so here's what I realized. I realize not everybody's going to agree with me. But my job is not to convince them. My job is to present grace and truth 100% equally as Jesus did and let the Holy Spirit convict them. And so I just lived what I knew to do. But here's what I decided. I decided in every conversation I was not going to let people sway me away from what my faith said was true. That might sound egotistical to some. That might sound cultish to some people. I don't care because what Jesus has done in my life, there is no evidential uh, system, no evidential structure that can define what God has done in my life. And because of that, my faith is secure. I do believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe he was raised from the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in tithing. I believe in living in righteousness. I believe in his grace. Why? Because it has transformed me. So while I cannot lay it out on paper and all this other stuff, I'm telling you there has been a life change in me. So I am secure in my faith. You have to have boundaries around your faith. Number two is this. You have to have boundaries around your soul. 
your soul. The Bible describes our soul in three distinct entities, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your mind is not your brain. Your brain is a physical object. It is an organ of your body. Your brain is alive only because of the lifeblood that is in it. Your brain is alive because your heart is pumping blood to it. But your brain is not a manifestation of your thoughts. Your brain is where memories are stored. Your brain is what causes your body to function correctly or sometimes incorrectly. Your mind is a spiritual source that God has put into you. That is where you process thoughts. That is where your imagination comes from. Your brain, though, is the organ that God uses to press those thoughts of the mind into your system. Does that make sense today? So your mind is a spiritual force. Your will can simply be described as this. I will do this. I will. It is what you choose to do. You have a will. The Bible says we have a free will. You get to choose what you do and do not do. But lastly is your emotions. And again, I want to be clear on this. Your emotions are not tied to your physical system. Some of us have hormonal imbalances. And so our emotions are skewed. I'm not talking about physical emotions. I'm talking about spiritual emotions. Fear is spiritual. Anger is spiritual, but so is happiness and peace and joy. There are emotions that you can feel. Your physical emotions you may not be able to control in the moment, but your spiritual emotions you can. And here's how I like to tell people. Your physical emotions are how you react to things. Your spiritual emotion is how you respond to things. It's two different things. But the Bible says there is a mind, will, and emotions. The mind is our spiritual processing. The will is I will do this. And the emotions are the spiritual emotions of how we respond. But it all starts with the mind. Romans 12 says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. One of the reasons I was able to build a healthy boundary around my soul regarding my faith is because I was not bombarded by nonstop allegations and criticism against my faith in Jesus. So I didn't, again, I didn't have social media. So I wasn't listening to people tell me the wrong thing. Now in conversations that might have happened, but I didn't go seeking out that information. Some of you need to stop scrolling through things that are trying to dissuade you. I'm okay with being challenged, but not with being told. So I have to be careful. Your soul's health depends on what you feed it. This is why there has to be a strong boundary around your soul. My friends have to know this. No, I won't look at that. No, I won't listen to that. No, I won't go there. No, I won't read that. No, I won't meditate on that. No, I won't talk about that. Now let's talk about that. Because what does that sound like? That sounds like a list of rules and regulations. And that's the religious mantra, right? Do not, thou shalt not. That is the religious mantra. Thou shalt not. And if you do, thou shalt not be here because I cannot be here with you. Thou shalt not. But because there's a boundary around my soul, I don't just tell my friends, I will not. What I also say is, I will not because I'm already doing this. I will not go there because I'm already in the house of the Lord. I will not read that because I've got too much studying to do in my Bible. I will not have that relationship because I've got a relationship with Jesus that trumps every other relationship. So I don't just present the I will not. I also present the I will Because if you just tell people what you won't do as a Christian, you sound like a loser. It sounds like just boring. Why would I I ever want to be a Christian? Your life sucks, man. You don't do this. You don't do that. You don't do this. You don't do that. But we never share what we actually do. Do you share the joy that you get from your relationship with God? Do you share, men, do you share the joy of, of, of going out and hunting and killing and gathering the gift that God gave you as a man to provide for your family? I celebrate that. I worship God because he put that in me. That's exciting for me. I don't just go, I don't cheat on my wife. Okay? Some people don't understand. I don't drink alcohol. Okay? What do you do? So if I got a boundary around my soul, it's not just about what I don't do. It's about what I do. Lastly, and I think this is the most important one, and it ties into every one of them, but boundaries around my friends. I I, I want boundaries around my faith. I want boundaries around my soul but I also want boundaries around my friends. This is the most unique boundary that we can create because this is the only boundary where I actually have a gate in each boundary. 
I have boundaries around my friends, but every boundary that I place in all seven of those categories, there's a gate. Why? Because Proverbs 18.24 says, one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Notice the writer here uses two words, unreliable, and then he also says friends. So you can actually have people who you claim are friends but are unreliable. But notice he also says in his wisdom, the one who has those unreliable friends, they're the one who comes to ruin. You ever had an unreliable friend? It seems like their life just keeps on going fine. But when they're unreliable, you're the one who comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. In other words, I was classifying unreliable people as close friends when they were actually friends of convenience. I was celebrating them as best friends, but they weren't best friends. They were friends of acquaintance. Proverbs 12, 26, the righteous, that's you and me, because we're made righteous in Christ Jesus, we choose our friends carefully, carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Hello? Have you ever done an audit of your friendships? Have you done an audit on what kind of a friend you are? When's the last time you looked at your list of friends? And let me clarify. Friends, not social media friends. Not that. Talking about actual friends. You talk to them. You have a relationship with them. Have you done an audit of your friends? And have you placed them in the correct categories? Some of the categories of friends I have, there are boundaries, and they have a gate. People can move from friends of acquaintance to my best friends, but it's going to take some work. People can move from being my best friend down to a friend of acquaintance. And it's actually much easier to move from there to there. Why? Because I never want to shy away from a friendship, but I want to make sure that I have boundaries around my friendships. I don't want people thinking that they are my close friend when they are not. If you're unreliable, I can't trust you with my spouse. I can't trust you with my children. I can't trust you with my material possessions. I can't trust you with my money. We can't be close. I can't, I can't have time with you. Let me talk to all y'all who think you're a good friend. If, if we say we're going to meet for lunch at 12 Oh, three. And you show up at 1233. And you try to blame CP time. We can't be friends. Because you're unreliable. I ain't getting no text message. Not I'm running late. Nothing. You just don't show up. If I ask you, can you watch my kids? But I find out you were on your phone the entire time instead of watching my kids. We can't be friends. Because that's my most treasured possession. We can be friends of acquaintance. I'll see you at church sometimes. I can say hi to you. You can comment on my Facebook post. But we're not, we're not close. You want to be my friend, but I see you checking out my wife's butt? <laughs> Men, am I lying? We, we can't be close friends. We can be friends where one of us has a black eye, but that's it. Y'all don't want to be honest here? If I'm your friend, but all I'm doing is taking from you, but when you need something in return, I'm not available. I'm not actually your friend. We have to be careful. If I'm your friend or you think I'm your friend, and when I bring up my relationship with Jesus, which you don't have, and all you do is yell and scream and kick and cuss, we're not as close as we think we are. Right. Now on the flip side, for those of you who have those friends who don't know Jesus, and when they bring up a religious conversation, you kick and cuss and scream at them with your old religious self. You're not really their friend. You're trying to be their savior. God only had one of those, and his name was Jesus. He didn't need you. If we're supposed to be friends, and all you're trying to do is control my life, we're not friends. I felt my spirit. I need to say, clarify this. Uh, if you're a student, if you're a kid, 
Yes, your parents have every right to control your life. They're not your friend. They're not supposed to be your friend. Not your best friend. Stop calling your parents your friend. They're not your friend. They're your parent. They're your mama and your daddy. And they're supposed to control every part of your life until you decide you are grown enough to live on your own, pay your own bills, buy your own groceries. Okay? So don't get it twisted. All right, now that I cut the students a little bit, let me cut you parents. Stop calling your kids your friends. They ain't your friends. They can be your friends when you're in a nursing home and they're grown doing their own thing. But stop calling them your friends. They're not your friends. They are children, and they are a gift from God to you to raise in the admonition of Jesus Christ. Stop trying to be friendly with them. The reason they act in a fool is because you're trying to be friendly with them. They don't need you to be friendly with them. They need you to smack that behind a few times. They need you to tell them the truth in love. They need you to tell them, look, I've been there. I've messed up. I've got grace for you, but that does not mean I'm going to let you run away from me. Stop trying to hang out with them at the, at the bars. Stop trying to hang out with them and their friends. You're old for a reason. <laughs> Stop trying to be a teenager again. Those years are gone. They don't need you to be a teenager. They don't need you to be a friend. They need you to be a father and a mother. Yeah. I got to have boundaries around my friends, which also means my kids will never be in that category with me. And I will never be in their friend category. My daughter, in fact, last year, I, I remember specifically because I thought she was about to cry when she said, she said, Daddy, you are my best friend. I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> no. She's five years old. She doesn't know what that really means. But I wanted to clarify in that moment. I wanted to have some discipline in this moment. I said, baby, I love you with all my heart, and I know you love Daddy, but I want you to know I will never be your friend. She said, why not? I said, because I'm your daddy, not your friend. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. She went to watching Paw Patrol. She didn't know. <laughs> So that wasn't in my notes, but I feel like the Holy Spirit said, whoop, let's put that in there. We build boundaries. And let me give you the way that you build boundaries. The number one and the most effective way you build boundaries is you communicate those boundaries to the people you're in a relationship with. The reason why we have such unhealthy friendships, the reason why this generation coming up is so bad at relationships, not all of them, but a majority of them, they're bad at relationships. The only relationship they can have is through a screen is because they don't know how to communicate their boundaries and what they're feeling in a right way. And where did that come from? It came from when they came to us trying to communicate with us, we shut them down. Get over it, kid. You shouldn't feel that way. And there's a time and a place for that, but it's not 99% of the time, I can tell you that. We have to teach this generation how to effectively build boundaries, and that means it starts with us, grown folks. We have to learn to communicate boundaries. You should have no qualms about sharing a boundary with someone who calls you their friend. You should have no qualms with approaching someone and saying, you said you would be here at this time and you didn't. Can I tell you something? That's disrespectful to me. That's disrespectful to everybody else in the group that you said you'd be on time for. Could you please correct that for us? They get mad. Peace. I love you. I'll pray for you. You need something? Call me. We ain't got that kind of friendship, though. There should be no problems with us having healthy boundaries. How do I know that? Because Jesus had healthy boundaries in his friendships. When you go read about those 12 disciples, there's a reason why he stuck with just 12. Although he had hundreds of disciples, he had 12 who he allowed to stay with him. Because he would walk through these hundreds of disciples and crowd, and he'd stop and he'd go, listen, listen, Linda, listen. <laughs> If you want to follow me, you better deny yourself, pick up your cross, and crucify your flesh on the daily. Yep. And he'd turn around, he'd start walking. He'd start hearing people just fl 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 flutter off. Then he turned back around. He'd say, listen, if you don't hate your father and mother and brother and sister for my sake in the gospel, you ain't no follower of mine. 
And he turned back around. He keep walking. There is a point in the Bible, and I, I need to remember this reference. There's a point in the Bible where it says he is following with a crowd and he begins to turn around and he begins to set boundaries for them in their lives. If you want to be my friend, here's what you need to know. He starts clarifying these boundaries. And before you know it, by the end of that chapter, the Bible says he turned back around and there were only the 12. You'll find out who your 12 are real quick when you communicate clearly what your boundaries are. When you set clear expectations, but your expectations should never be glorifying to you. Your expectations should be glorifying to God. 